We are pleased to have with us today Barbara Wish. Barbara is Professor Emerita of Art History at the State University of New York College at Cortland. A specialist in Roman visual and festive culture, she has written extensively on confraternities, miracle working images, holier processions and maps, and anti-Semitism in Renaissance visual culture. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to participate in this celebration. Uh, thank you so much for having me and discussing Jewish culture in early modern Italy by looking at fashion and how Jews chose to represent themselves. So I thought I would divide our discussion into three parts. And the first would be on Jewish self-fashioning. We might start by taking a look at some of the exquisite and lavishly illustrated manuscripts commissioned by the most wealthy Jewish families. And the ones that we're looking at are predominantly from Northern Italy. Let us start here. This is a, a ring and wedding dance ceremony, as you can see, uh, that was done in 1435. And I've included all the information, if viewers want to go more slowly and pause the recording, uh, to read all the details. One thing that I just might point out here before we look at the image itself, that by the mid 15th century, this extremely rich manuscript was owned by a cardinal in Rome. And he set up a school for indigent students who were planning on an ecclesiastical career. So these manuscripts were appreciated not just within the Jewish community, but within the Christian community as well. And they are exquisitely illustrated with the finest of materials. You can see the gold leaf all around mm -hmm. the edge. Now, the Jews dressed themselves in fantastically rich garments. The problem with using illustrations or illuminations from manuscripts as an indication of real life is a lot of this, of course, is wishful thinking. And costume historians must be wary of illustrations uh, versus real life. But let's take a look at some of this exquisite fashioning. So I've put here some comparisons. First, if we look at the women's headdresses with these uh, bulbous uh, head coverings that had uh, uh, light wood or wire frames, you can see that the uh, Jewish bride is wearing the same kind of headdress and uh, even with the kind of sleeves on the dress as this fresco depiction of a princess. So this is high fashion from Northern Italy. The groom uh, in the wedding dance wears this incredible hat that you can see both in this drawing by Pisanello of three standing men. And it's thought that these were done after the retinue as uh, Empress Sigismund, that is the Holy Roman Emperor, was coming back from Rome after having been crowned King of the Romans and Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope and made his uh, processions through Italy. And it was fascinating to everyone. And you can see the kind of exquisite costumes and how much fabric it took to make these outfits. And they were fur lined as well. Textiles were extremely expensive and people didn't have a large closet full of clothes, you know, to go through, to give it away. If you haven't worn it in five years, you give it away. That's, you know, the standard go-to here in New York anyway. But uh, clothes were expensive and people had very few outfits and they would reuse the fabrics and remake the clothes as well. 
So here is another illustration celebrating Kiddush at Sikot and a Purim ball. And as I note here, this is the earliest depiction of people wearing costumes on Purim. Now, what you start to notice with the men is that they are not bearded. Jews did not wear beards as a, a general thing. Europeans did not in the 15th century. Only the most religious Jews would have had a beard. The biblical figures will be shown bearded. And you can see the different kinds of hats and cloaks. They are absolutely in Renaissance attire. Uh, for the Purim ball, we see uh, the fool's costume and note the men have rather large cod pieces on as part of the Purim festivities. One can't help but notice it. But we might really look at the woman on the right's headdress. This is an international style, very exquisite, very expensive, the double horned and non with a veil. There's no real translation from the French. And these were coming in from France and Burgundy. The court of Burgundy in the 15th century was the place for fashion and manners. And many of the Italian potentates would send their sons to the court of Burgundy to learn how to dress and how to act as a proper courtier. And so we can see this marvelous double horned headdress with exquisite veils, translucent silk uh, in the one on the left with a brocaded band and sort of wire sides covered in fabric that's also covered in pearls. I mean, I think you can see the exquisiteness of this and our Jewish matron, uh, otherwise she would not be dancing with a man, uh, is wearing the same kind of headdress. So fashion was known and very much cared about and Jews chose to have themselves depicted in this way. Now, in some of the illuminations, we're not sure whether it's a Jewish or a Christian artist. Certainly the scribes were Jewish to write in Hebrew, but with the artists themselves, unclear who it is. Now, we might look at this uh, manuscript as well, this book, the Rothschild Miscellany, uh, which is the most elaborate uh, book that was made uh, during this period. Uh, and you can see it was done probably in Ferrara, again, northern Italy, between 1465 and uh, 1478. Uh, the patron, whose uh, name is inscribed on folio 106, uh, and his name tr uh, translated into Italian, Ha Cohen, is translated as sacerdoti, which means priests in Italian. And he was a wealthy banker. Now, it's perhaps not surprising uh, that uh, an important illustration of Job with the inscription on the top that says, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before, uh, rather than showing the afflicted Job and all his sufferings, and the wealthy banker chose to show himself as a Renaissance prince in front of his grand palazzo with his uh, large family dressed in absolute contemporary Italian style. Now, to be a, a Jewish banker, you had a contract with a, diff a special city, so you were allowed to do business there. Few were very wealthy bankers, and we will return to this point again and again. Most were pawnbrokers at the time, uh, charging small interest. The great international banking was really done by Christian bankers like the Medici. We always need to keep this in perspective. So Barbara, these oh, th there is some... Back. There were some wealthy families, uh, Jewish families. Um, what percentage of the Jewish population did this uh, caste represent? Very few. There mm -hmm. were wealthy bankers and wealthy physicians. 
These are the two gr uh, greatest positions. Of course, Christian law officially prohibited uh, Christians uh, from being treated by Jewish doctors. And of course, Jews were not allowed to get an official medical degree from the universities nor wear the official doctor's garments because it meant uh, taking an oath, uh, a Christian oath at the end of graduation. So and I suppose, I suppose we don't have pictures of the less wealthy well, I'll, I'll show you some outfits, at least people working, that we can see as well. But Great. the less wealthy uh, look just like the less wealthy uh, in Italy at the time. But here are more wealthy people again. And obviously, I enjoy the women's headdresses, this uh, conical enon with a veil. We get to know them as princess outfits, I think, in today's Disney lingo. But this is where it comes from, again, from the northern court of Burgundy. So we have an Italian woman who was living in Bruges at the time being portrayed. And you can see, although she is lined with fur and has many more jewels on, that the Jewish women, again, married with their head covered, dancing with men, uh, are really depicted in a very similar way. And again, you see the men uh, do not have beards and do not have their heads covered. They did not wear uh, the skull cap or yarmulke during the day. This is a much later invention. And you can see they're all bare bareheaded here and non-bearded. And mixed dancing. Mixed dancing, but only married couples. Mm -hmm. Now, you wanted to see some more ordinary people. Here they are preparing for Passover. You wouldn't be all dressed up. So uh, the women are depicted in gray, sort of dark colors, but the same kind of a uh, long gown style with the chemise underneath, and their heads are covered. This is typical for all married women in the Renaissance and young women too. And I compare that far more simple dress to this fresco from an oratory of the confraternity of the good men of St. Martin, the Buonomini di San Martino. And this group went to people who were the good poor. That is, they weren't vagrants, uh, but had fallen on uh, hard times, and they were there to help support them. So here we see the confraternity members taking an inventory of what was kept in this kind of uh, trousseau uh, box. And what you see with the mother of the family, how poorly dressed she is. You can see her dress has patches on it. I think you can see that. And her shoes have holes in the toes, as does her husband on the right, who's leaning over. You can just see his toe sticking out. There are patches on the dresses of the young women uh, standing in the doorway, the daughters. And they're hoping to take an inventory and, of course, get proper dowries so they can marry their daughters. You couldn't marry or even go into a nunnery without a dowry. So these are the confraternity members who helped uh, the honorable poor, the ashamed poor, who were too good to beg in, in that sense. But you see the kind of simple clothes that would be worn, not the fancy brocades and velvets and furs. And this is comparable to what we see in the preparation for Passover in the Rothschild miscellany. As I said, clothes were very expensive. And you would patch your clothes, and you would take parts and remake them. And one of the activities that were permitted for Jews, or uh, really after 1555 was one of the few activities they were, uh, or business activities in which they were allowed to participate, was secondhand goods. And that is clothes. Now, before this was assigned to them, you could make a good living. 
People didn't throw away clothes, but rather would sell them, get money, they would be remade into other things. Uh, and so you can see how patched and worn uh, are these clothes. And this is really indicative of life in the Renaissance. Uh, and, and in a later period, uh, in, in Yiddish, they would refer to them as shmatas. And yes, there, there would seem and, to be many, many Jews, uh, you know, centuries later, uh, further north, who made their living selling these these shmatas. Yes, because that was one of the few activities. And uh, you, you've already seen the end of, of the slides that I've put together. And I will show you just such a peddler of clothes like that. But in the 15th century, you could make a good living doing this. Now, this is one of the really beautiful uh, manuscripts uh, as well. And you can see uh, the scribe who uh, signs himself as Abraham Judah ben Yahiel, uh, son of Nathaniel, son of Moses, the famous physician from Camerino. So once again, a wealthy banker or a famous uh, physician. These are the really educated people as well. So this manuscript was written in Florence uh, for the Gallico family in 1490. And it's thought that it was perhaps a wedding gift for a child of Elijah Gallico and a member of the Norse family because their coat of arms are on this manuscript. You can see the little putti, the little cherubs riding roosters. That's a gallo in Italian. And very often Italian coats of arms play off on the family name. This is not a Jewish tradition by any means, but a Christian tradition that is adopted by the Jews. And the same with the Norsa family coat of arms uh, at the bottom. The Norses were extremely wealthy bankers and we will return to their issues uh, later on when we go to Mantua. I think we should note that possession of a manuscript indicated wealth. Before, before printing came about, which would be coming around soon, uh, these, were, these were tremendously dear and expensive and, and beautifully illustrated volumes. Yes, I mean, you just turn the pages and many of these now have been digitized. Uh, so you can go to the different libraries and turn them page by page and just be astounded at the beauty. So very often we don't know the names of the illuminators who were actually doing the work and art historians have tried to find different hands as well, uh, but uh, they really are extraordinary. Uh, here is another one, again, where we can turn to fashion with Moses receiving the tablets of the law. Now, Moses is in a long tunic, wearing a turban and has a beard. Again, this is typical biblical garb, but he looks very different from the contemporary Israelites below. So let's look at the Israelites. And you can see uh, that they are in the most exquisite contemporary Italian garb. And I show you details from the Medici Chapel, the journey of the Magi, where we see Piero and Cosimo de' Medici, the de facto rulers of Florence on the upper left. And you can see the kind of exquisite and expensive brocades that they're wearing. And the Jews have had themselves portrayed in equally fabulous and expensive fabrics. And you can see the kind of doublets that the men wear, uh, that the boys wear as well. There wasn't special children's fashion uh, at the time. Uh, so you can see that here. And again, the women in their dresses with their head covered. And on the far right, uh, you see a young woman with her hair braided down her back, but not wearing a head covering. She is unmarried, as you see uh, in the fresco, the detail of the birth of the Virgin. So again, the Jews are having themselves presented 
in the same way that society allowed them to go around. And I think you can see uh, that uh, she's wearing shoes, like wooden clogs. Can you see the little red uh, wooden clogs on her feet below the dress? Shoes, and again, you can see the kind of boots on the lower left here, uh, were made of leather. Shoes were very expensive and they were all individually made. So if you wore a fine little slipper of velvet, silk lined or even calfskin, you didn't go slip around in the mud and such things. You wore wooden clogs and that protected your feet going out. And uh, we don't have that many illustrations of them, but you can see them very distinctly here. So I thought that was fun to point out. Now, Jewish attire. Of, for a religious ceremony, you can see this man who's carrying the Torah scroll with its brocade covering, wearing the talit over his head. Once again, the kippah was not part of even Jewish religious wear at this time, although he is shown with a beard. But the other young man on the lower left, who has taken off his shoes uh, for the fast day, of the ninth of Av is praying with us uh, and reading a book uh, with a single lamp. And he is dressed just as we've seen all the other Jews. Again, in our uh, young man blowing the shofar, wearing a cap, wearing the same kind of brocade doublet uh, with an undergarment as well. You really cannot distinguish them in any way in these manuscripts, except if they're uh, performing a particular religious act like holding up the Torah that requires the Talit. Now, we've shown that in the 15th century that uh, Jews could have themselves portrayed in the most exquisite and lavish contemporary fashion. We can also look at medals as well. And here we see this medal, the obverse and reverse of Elijah de Lattes, Ebreo, the Jew, as he has himself labeled. And on the reverse, Rika, his mother. Now, these were important people. If you could afford a portrait medallion, you were really up there on the social hierarchy. So this is the son and wife of Emmanuel de Lattes, physician to Pope Leo X. Now, the popes often had Jewish physicians. Again, in canon law, this was absolutely not permitted. But there are always exceptions. And who didn't want a Jewish doctor? So we find that again and again uh, in the papal court. They had Hebrew scholars that were given all kinds of special privileges and the physician as well. So we see them here. So it might not surprise you at this point to see in an almost contemporary painting that they are interchangeable, except for the word Hebreo, uh, with contemporary Catholics in a devotional painting, as you see the outfit for the man, with the beard is exactly the same. And we need to note that by the 16th century, beards for men came, were in and were very fashionable where it wasn't in the 15th century. I mean, when Henry VIII was strutting around with his great red beard, this was an astonishment uh, to European nobility. They couldn't believe it. He looked, they called him a wild man in that sense. But uh, as the century went on, beards became fashionable. And uh, you can see that Elijah wears exactly the same kind of beard, though clearly has better hair uh, than the donor on the left. And the, the hair covering of his mother, Rika, and her garment is just the same, uh, comparable to the new styles that we're seeing. So at this moment, and here we are in 1552 with the bronze uh, medal, 
we're still at a place that's good for the Jews, as has been said. Starting in 1553, things will change dramatically. For in Rome, that's when the Talmud was publicly burned. Mm -hmm. And we will see then 1555 with the establishment of the ghetto in Rome, that will change everything. So let us turn to the issues of distinguishing Jews because the church felt that Jews had an important place in theology. The New Testament, as they called it, stood on the shoulders of the Hebrew scriptures, now called the Old Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And the Jews were witnesses of, to God's creation and all those things. Nonetheless, Church doctrine demanded that Christians have a superior social position, and this hierarchy must be maintained. So therefore, it finally happened in 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council that initiated the official church policy of distinctive dress for Jews. Now, this had already been done in a uh, Islam in the 8th century, that Jews and Christians were marked separately from Muslims. But in the Christian world, this happens in 1215, where it said Jews of both sexes and in every Christian province and at all times shall be distinguished in public from other people by a difference in dress. Now, they never said exactly what that difference in dress should be. And so it seemed to have been left to the different rulers to decide exactly what they wanted to do. But let's start by looking at Rome, because from Rome, everything radiates outward. Now, as you see, by 1257, the circular Jewish badge uh, was mandated for Jewish males to make sure you could see the difference between Jews and Christians in their dress. Now, although uh, Leviticus 18.3 says the Jews should not imitate others' styles of dressing, that's not the way the real world actually worked, as, as we've seen illustrated before. So Christians now felt it was important to distinguish. And in all these statutes, when they're talking about the, uh, the circular badge, they're very careful to distinguish the exact size and the width of it. I mean, it's really extraordinary to follow these documents across Europe. But Rome switches by the mid 14th century, and the city statutes then mandate a red tabard that is a short, heavy cape uh, over outer garments. And then we're back again by 1479 to the yellow circle designated as the real badge. Married Jewish women, on the other hand, uh, were exempted from the badge, but by the 15th century, they had to wear a red overskirt and a specially pointed veil marked with two blue stripes. What about unmarried Jewish women? No, they're, they're, it's okay for girls. They can go unmarked, but mm. uh, they start distinguishing for boys over 13 mm. that are men. And so they have to follow through. But the girls kind of escape this uh, as they did with their hair down as we've seen in the illustrations. So cities north of Rome, uh, married Jewish women had to wear a long yellow veil, but so did prostitutes. And this oh, is where it comes. Some prostitutes then had to wear, a, in some cities, a red overskirt. And uh, that's where we get the scarlet letter when they wore a red mark. Now, hoop earrings for girls over 10 years old and women then were mandated. 
And just to clarify, these are not mandated by the Jewish community. They're mandated oh, no, no, by the no, no, external no. This Christian. The Christian community. Remember, they only lived in any Christian community by contracts for which they paid extreme taxes to be able to live and work there. So these are impositions of marks of distinction uh, to make sure that Christian superiority was visible at all times. And so although Jewish males were circumcised, the preachers, the Christian preachers railed that Jewish women uh, must have these hoop earrings as a kind of mark equivalent to circumcision so they could be distinguished. Originally, in the Fourth Lateran Council's decree, one of the big concerns was intercourse, the grave sin of intercourse between Jews and Christians. Therefore, Jews and Jewesses must be marked. So this did not happen. We're talking about sexual intercourse here, not just chit chat. Uh, so this was a very big concern. Now, if we look at badges, because we're talking about the circular badge, and you see that uh, in the bottom part of this slide, religious badges were common in the Renaissance. And I show you on the left a confraternity, uh, and you, you can see the badge with the cross on it. Uh, and all confraternities, these lay religious brotherhoods, were marked on the upper right shoulder with a badge that showed their affiliation. This was nothing new. Pilgrims had badges, and I show you some of the lead badges uh, that uh, would be worn, the shell, the most common badge of pilgrimage, when the shells were actually picked up on the beach at Santiago de Compostela, that northern pilgrimage route. But it became a generic symbol for pilgrimage, and you see this print of the pilgrims. They also have uh, what seem to be like the cross keys or cross nails, the symbol of Rome. For Rome was the new Jerusalem and had so many relics there. For example, the other badge that was became a symbol of Rome, this round badge, with the face of Jesus imprinted on Veronica's veil. That holy imprint, Jesus on his way to the crucifixion, Veronica, that vera icon, the true image, her name uh -huh. represents what happened. Uh, wiped the sweat from his brow and miraculously Jesus's face was on the cloth. And this cloth became a relic in Rome and one of the most highly visited and venerated relics of all that had touched Jesus. And these would be sewn onto the garments, the yes. shell on the mill? Mm -hmm. Yes, as you can see here, sewn or pinned. Mm -hmm. Uh, in that way. And this, the shell, gave the pilgrims the right of passage. And this is also why Jews wanted to be exempt from wearing the badge or the, the colored coat or anything, because when traveling, they could be attacked as Jews. And so they all often uh, asked for special privileges when traveling not to wear the badge. Of course, they didn't want to wear the badge normally, but when traveling, it was particularly important. Popes would give decrees that if you hurt a pilgrim, you know, you'd go straight to hell, do not pass go. Uh, so pilgrims had their special outfits, the hat, the scarf, and as you can see, the shell badge, which distinguished them and protected them. The Jewish badge, unfortunately, did not protect the Jews. Now, to give an idea of the other aspects that we saw, the red overskirt or red uh, cape, we can see it in these predella panels, that is small narrative panels that were under a great altarpiece for a confraternity of Corpus Domini, that is the body of the Lord in Urbino. And Barbara, well, can, can we interrupt just for a minute to explain to people who may not know what is a confraternity? 
Oh, a confraternity uh, is traditionally a group of lay people who have gotten together to enhance their religious devotion and do works of charity. Those two things go hand in hand. And they were ubiquitous across Europe at the time. And they had their own buildings as well? If they were wealthy enough, they had their own buildings. They might have an altar in a church. If they were wealthy enough, a, a chapel that they decorated or a, a whole church and a separate oratory that is a sort of rectangular prayer hall where they met for both administrative and religious functions. Great. So some of them became incredibly wealthy, but pretty much confraternities ran public welfare uh, in late medieval and early modern Europe. They ran the orphanages, uh, the conservatories for young women, hospitals, all those things. And again, as we saw earlier, making sure that this poor family had enough for dowries for their daughters and enough to live on. And then, of course, we'll, talk about, the, we'll talk about the Jewish confraternities uh, as well. Yes. Yes, I mean, in just the same way, uh, to bury the dead properly, to take care of the poor. These are absolutely uh, parallel human associations uh, that we find on, on both sides of this line. So I wanted to look at these uh, narrative panels to tell the story of the host libel as it's often called, with the profanation of the host. And the story will allow us to understand the very complicated position of the Jews. What we see on the top is a Jewish pawnbroker. Again, we can sort of recognize him from his uh, red overgarment that he's wearing. But what, although pawnbrokers were not only permitted, but a certain number were welcomed, into Christian communities. And this came out of uh, Deuteronomy 23, thou shalt not lend uh, upon interest to thy brother, but it's okay to lend to strangers. Therefore, when the Christians absorbed Deuteronomy, Jews were the strangers. And so uh, they could lend on interest and do the pawnbroking. And, uh, Early modern Europe really depended on the pawnbrokers for the poor to have some ready cash in this way. And they, they played an important part in the economic system. But what was forbidden, and you're sort of forewarned by seeing the coat of arms with the scorpion on it uh, in the background, is to deal with Christian holy objects. And here comes this Christian woman holding up a Eucharistic wafer. This was forbidden in any way. And yet the Jewish pawnbroker accepts it. So what happens as we see in below, the Jews, and again, this is part of the host libel. So I'm telling it from that story, were couldn't possibly believe that a Eucharistic wafer for which the proper ritual for transubstantiation had been said, that is changed into the body of Christ as the wine had been changed into his blood, was real. And therefore, sometimes they'll stab it with a knife. And here you see them frying up the host in a frying pan and it bleeding profusely uh, to the chagrin and amazement of this Jewish family. For we see the wife with her red overskirt and the yellow veil, and again, the husband wearing his red tabard. So what happens is the blood starts to leak out the door and warns the Christians what is going on. If we, of course, if we jump to the end of the story, they're burned at the stake, uh, which is often uh, the result of these libel stories, the killing of Christian children to use their blood for the matzah at Passover time, and on and on this goes. Uh, but what we see here is the pawnbroker. Now it's interesting because these panels were done just as the Monte de Pietà was established in the city of Urbino. And this is a 
Christian charitable loan bank, trying to uh, replace what was referred to as usurious Jewish uh, pawnbroking at the time. And it's in particular the Franciscan friars who are preaching vehemently against the Jews as pawnbrokers, calling them leeches and rabid dogs. And this then becomes the moment where the use of the badge will become reinforced due to the Franciscan preaching at the time. These laws were on the books, not so much, nobody cared, things were going along uh, in Italy. Now we also mentioned earrings. <laughs> Now, in this uh, 14th century painting of the Virgin Mary, here I'm showing you a detail. You can see she's got a earring with other jewels hanging down from it. In the 15th century, no way would she wear earrings because now the hoop earrings were put on Jewish women. Uh, and who else was forced to wear earrings? You can guess prostitutes. And often prostitutes had uh, little bells to let them know you were coming. If you remember the scene from Gone with the Wind, when Belle, the prostitute, is in the carriage and going to help Scarlet, and she's got earrings that are little bells, so they tinkle uh, when she's there. This is where this tradition comes from. And of course, they wouldn't think that the mother of Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> Right. No, but uh, from the good Jewish line in that way, she is, but she follows the rituals because she's supposed to with this presentation of Jesus in the temple and the purification, though she doesn't need it. Uh, but again, she cannot be marked as a Jewess mm -hmm. uh, with earrings because the earrings had this libidinous association to them. Fashion will overcome this, you can be sure, and earrings will come back in style, but not at this moment with the Franciscan friars preaching against uh, too much ornamentation. Now, of course, uh, Jewish law too proscribed uh, too much ornamentation. Don't go around showing off your wealth, but this is a different kind of marking of people. And what is most surprising is to find it on the Sistine Chapel ceiling itself. And I show you a detail here of Aminadab, one of the ancestors of Jesus that are named uh, in the 40 generations that Matthew opens his gospel book with this. And this goes around uh, the ceiling and you can see the arrow where Aminadab. And you see also below, though it's no longer there, perhaps you can see the steps against the left wall. That is where the papal throne was. Now, right above that papal throne is a minadab marked with the Jewish badge. Now, there is no way uh, that he, as uh, the, the uh, fa uh, father-in-law of the high priest Aaron, was a bad Jew. He helped to carry the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. But yet the contemporary circle stitched onto his cloak, his being the other, the Jew in that sense. Mm -hmm. Now we know from uh, the exquisite conservation that was done of the ceiling, this was not added in the later period uh, when it got really bad for the Jews and the ghetto walls went up. But rather, if we look at a drawing from Michelangelo in his study for this figure, we can see that the badge is already in the proper place on the right side, on the upper right shoulder. That he didn't put it there, I would suggest because of the way the cloak changes color and is not flat, the circle could be best observed 
where the light is coming and the flat piece of fabric. And this is exactly what was promulgated in the laws that talked about the badges. It must be visible. You can't hide it under pleats. You can't fold it under a coat. You can't have a large collar. So we see that happening here. And this figure is seated as if he were a slave. And besides grimacing, he is wearing earrings. Now, earrings might be worn by a Hebrew slave who didn't want his freedom, or as this most libidinous attribute. Men did not wear earrings. We're probably used to seeing Shakespeare with a single pearl earring, but that's a century later that that becomes fashionable for men. Here, for a man wearing earrings, uh, the preachers were railing against this excess or ornamentation, how bad for women, how even worse for men, for such foppery in this way. I mean, this was just beyond the pale. So this figure, this Jewish ancestor is marked as a Jew in this larger and broader sense. It's astounding and horrifying. So I thought then we might turn to Mantua itself and look at what is going on there and eventually get us back to Solomone Rossi himself. As I understand it, the, the culture and the politics of the north of Italy could be very different from that of the, the papal area for the south. Absolutely. Each region, and they had different levels of rulers by the time we, we're in the court of Mantua. First they are Marquis, and then uh, after 1530 it becomes a duchy. Uh, they can make their own rules. You've got general church policy, but uh, they will define it as they will, what is convenient for them. They will make their own contracts, usually about 10 years for the Jews, for the bankers and the Jewish community uh, that is there as well. Those are often two separate sets of contracts that are going on. So I thought we might start then uh, in the late 15th century with Francesco II Gonzaga, the Marquis, of Mantua and his wife, the very famous Isabella d'Este, who was a fashion plate. Now you can see she brought back this wonderful style of headdress that everyone wanted to copy. Oh, please note she is 60 years old in this portrait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, extremely vain. She was the fashion plate and she insisted on wearing earrings, but they're pearl drops. They are not hoops. So you can see by this time, by the 1530s, as men are now wearing beards, <laughs> women can wear earrings. That has been uh, relaxed. But you see her elaborate dress. Uh, she was also a vicious anti-Semite. But let us tell the story, and we had mentioned the name before, of the Norsa family. And uh, a prominent Jewish banker, Daniele da Norsa, bought a house in Mantua in 1493. And above the door was a fresco of the, the Madonna and Child with Saints. And he had written approval from the bishop that he could whitewash the fresco and that was just fine. Wow. He was allowed to do this. Uh, they needed his money and he played plenty for these privileges and the taxes. Now, Francesco is off to war against the French. He's not doing so well, but he needs to cover this. So in a big festival for a feast day in Mantua in 1495, some people had written uh, a graffiti and uh, sort of anti-Christian things on Norse's house. And this set him up uh, to be stoned. Uh, and everyone was very, very upset. So his house 
was raised. And this church of Santa Maria della Vittoria, St. Mary of the Victory was put up in its place. Uh, Francesco uh, demanded this. And you see uh, the painting that became the main altarpiece uh, on the left. And Daniele was forced then uh, to not only pay for the building of the church, but to pay Montaigne, a famous painter at the time, 110 ducats, a, a tremendous amount of money to pay for this altarpiece. And he had to do it, raise the money in three days or be hanged. <laughs> Francesco wasn't fooling around. Uh, so this is what happened. The church went up. And then after that, a second altarpiece was commissioned. And this, uh, from this, we have the famous detail of the Norsa family, the elder Danieli, perhaps his son Isaac, with their wives, absolutely humbled at the bottom of this painting as well, for which they had to pay. And we can see uh, that St. Jerome on the left is holding a, a model of the church that was built, the Santa Maria della Vittoria. Uh, you can see, and we saw the church in the previous slide. But what uh, at the top, again, so we know what all this is about in Latin and translated, the temerity of the Jews subdued. And there we have it. And it's Isabella herself who orders and creates the edict in 1496, as all this tumult is going on, that Jews must display the circular yellow badge. So this painting of around 1499, you see when the laws get to be enforced, she's very moved by a Franciscan preacher there. It's really the observant Franciscans who are viciously anti-Semitic, uh, in this way, or anti-Judaic, uh, and insist on the badge and the separation of the Jews. Now, it was Isabella who ordered in her 1496 edict that Jews must display the circular yellow badge. I know you've noted uh, that it looks slightly orangey here. I, I think these are just the different photographs, but the document itself says yellow. And it often says saffron yellow in these documents, they demand it. Now, saffron was the most expensive yellow. Saffron is made from the dried stamens of a purple crocus, and it takes, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flowers uh, to get these little stamens to create the dye. Now it's unclear uh, who actually made the badges and what the fabric was. We don't really know in all cases, but you can be sure the Jews had to pay for the badge that they had to wear and on and on it goes, like the taxes to remain in a city that were always exorbitant uh, in that way. And the, the men have beards, the Jewish men have beards in this picture. Yes, in this case they do. Uh, whether they did or not, uh, these are always said to be highly realistic uh, portraits, but we don't know what these people really looked like, except mm -hmm. they look extremely humbled uh, Daniele's nose is extremely hooked. <laughs> so is this an exaggeration? We mm -hmm. haven't seen this in any of the manuscripts before. You know, we're a little bit at a loss to know these things. Now, our conversations had all started off worrying about the color of the badge. So I thought I might make a little chart of changing colors and why. So let us uh, really move, go back to Rome, you know, where things start in the 16th century. It switches from the yellow circular badge 
and this is the holy year of 1525. That is uh, the great celebration uh, for Catholics when all sins can be uh, dismissed. Uh, if you uh, go on a pilgrimage to Rome and with the proper rituals. But now Clement VII imposes the yellow hat for Jews. In 1555, Paul IV renews the yellow hat but adds a yellow rectangular head covering for married women. That is about three feet square instead of the veil that they had. Yellow is the color to mark them. But Paul also establishes the ghetto with this famous bull, cum nimis absurdum. It's, and bulls, that is papal uh, decrees, are named after their opening words. And this is, since it is absurd and improper that Jews, and it goes on that they should live too freely among Christians. So this establishes the ghetto. This establishes uh, the few jobs that they may have, that uh, they may not associate with Christians if they're not wearing the yellow hat. And uh, it's a very long document that really is demanding this visible and physical separation as the ghetto walls go up. Now, by 1623, they may substitute a red hat. And we know that Jews did not want to wear the yellow badge. Yellow was the color of infamy at this point. Yellow is not gold, but it is the color of infamy. It probably comes all the way back from uh, the theory of the, of the four humors of the body, of yellow bile is collar. You, uh, and if you're imbalanced, you're angry and disgruntled, then this is not a good thing. When your liver is bad, you get jaundiced. This is yellow in that way. Uh, and again, the Muslims had used yellow for the Jews way back in the eighth century. So this is a long tradition to associate with this color. But though we don't have specific documents about it, I think we assume if the Jews get to negotiate anything as they renew their contracts and what's possible to do, that by 1623, they may substitute a red hat, but not too bright a shade, because as the story goes, an old archbishop had come to Rome and saw a Jew with a bright red hat, and his eyesight was very bad and thought he was a cardinal and treated him with the dignity of this high ecclesiastical rank and Jews must never be treated with such dignity. Therefore, the red must be distinguished. And uh, we will go back at the end to, to look at these changes in Rome because as you can see, the discussions go on and on and on. In Venice, not so far from Mantra, and we know that Rossi went to Venice, uh, the yellow circle of braided rope. And now the women from 1443 were no longer exempt. And in 1496, again, our same year as Mantra, when the badge is being really reinforced, uh, the yellow hat or other yellow covering. That is, they may not wear black hats that regular men, Christian men would wear. And they're not allowed to even have taffeta black linings of their hats because then they could turn them inside out and perhaps cheat on them. I mean, the statutes go on and on. And we know that the first ghetto was established in Venice, but uh, then by 1581, Jews are to wear the red hat in Venice. So things change. Why from a badge to a hat? The hats are simply more visible. What we want from the mid 16th century on is visibility to ensure this separation. So if we turn to Mantua, we've seen that 1496, Isabella with three edicts uh, imposes the yellow circle. 
So here married women are exempt, but girls must cover their shoulders with a yellow veil. You had asked about what about the girls? Eventually we get to the girls. Um, then in 1540, we have a yellow badge for all Jews. And they are so specific in the dimensions of one third of an arm long. So figure what, uh, one third, that's about eight inches, I expect. The width of a silk cord costing two soldi uh, for an arm's length, the brazzo, and sewn all around onto the upper right of the mantle. That means it's got to be stitched on. Literally, it can't flop around. It must be seen. But clearly, that's not enough. In 1577, this is when the change comes. We need now two orange badges. Had the Jews argued not for yellow and perhaps for orange because it's not as disreputable, but there are two badges in any event. One a half arm long and one finger wide on the mantle, affixed two fingers from the closure. Again, the detail of it it is just amazing. <laughs> or, and on the hat or other felt head covering, two fingers above the brim, except when traveling. So once again, making sure you have the exemption when traveling is absolutely crucial uh, because Jews were peddlers and merchants and they traveled from city to city and they needed that kind of safe passage of not wearing the badge. But if you got caught not wearing the badge, following your third transgression, uh, you would have to wear the orange hat, not just a badge on the hat, which seemed to be from these descriptions, a kind of ribbon. The orange hat must be worn at all times. And again, with these came monetary fines. And if you really were caught so many times without the badge, you could be whipped or uh, they could use the corda, which was a torture device uh, to, to get true confessions uh, in that way. So to be caught without it was really problematic. Now, instead of two badges in 1605, we moved to just an orange badge on the hat. And in 1610 through 12, the ghetto is finally established in Mantua. You can see how late this is compared to the other cities. And it takes them a couple of years to get organized. And by 1612, all Jews are compelled to live there. So let us go for who's who uh, in Mantua at the time of Solomon Rossi Ebreo, as he is designated. We've got uh, Vincenzo I, these are the Gonzaga Dukes. And as I said, after 1530, Mantua becomes a duchy. And so he gives the first exemption in 1606. Then Francesco IV, poor thing, uh, barely lived uh, to do it, but he was so proud of becoming Duke, he gave an exemption in 1612. And then Ferdinando I gives the third, which I have found in 1619. We have no idea what Salomone Rossi looks like. We know what his music looked like and sounded like. So that's... Yes. And for that is surely more important. Yes. So what was it like at this point uh, in Mantua? Not easy. Although they had good contracts, there are wealthy people. Uh, I show you this broadside from 1602, again, four years before Rossi first gets his exemption from wearing the badge. Um, uh, uh, once again, uh, a Franciscan friar was preaching vastly anti Semitic themes and said that he went by a synagogue and he heard the Jews mocking God and Christian rituals. Therefore, seven Jews were hanged, and they were hanged by their feet, which is even worse than being hanged by your neck, 
it's more disreputable, as uh, you can see. And they are even named here. And the devils are overseeing this hanging. This is really an anti-Semitic uh, print of 1602. And once again, you see one of the names was uh, Jacobe Sacerdote. His name was Cohen. Hmm. And so it's translated into Italian. And it's after this incident, again, um, leaders of well, the Dukes in this case are never happy with lots of disruption. They don't like riots. They don't like problems. So together with the Jewish community, Duke Vincenzo begins negotiations about establishing a ghetto. Now, ghettos are often uh, projected as a safe haven for the Jews, where they can be locked in at night. They're not allowed out during uh, Easter week uh, for fear the Christians would be so upset uh, at seeing them. For now, for example, that Purim overlaps with Lent, and Purim is a carnival festival, but Lent is a penitential 40 days. If Jews are caught celebrating, how awful clearly they're making fun of Christian rituals. And so it's interpreted time and time again. So uh, during Easter week, for example, the ghetto doors would be locked to protect the Jews it was stated. <laughs> uh, so uh, these negotiations go on, nothing happens very quickly, and it takes them two years to get the ghetto established, and by 1612, all Jews are compelled to live in the ghetto. In the ghetto, they usually don't have to wear their badges, but if they step out for just a bit, they must wear the hat with the badge. But again, they negotiate when traveling not to have to do that. And particularly for Rossi, uh, who needs to go back and forth outside of the ghetto and to other uh, places, it's crucial to have that exemption. But let's, 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 let's talk about oh, that for a minute. Um, sure. Would Rossi have been compelled to wear the badge while he was in the palace playing the violin? I would doubt it because he has exemptions not to wear it. And mm -hmm. I expect that was a broad exemption. Uh -huh. I don't know, it's a wonderful question. Uh, because badges on hats is fashion statements. One can go through the 16th century and see these most elegant men. Here is Castiglione who set up in uh, the, the court for what the courtier should be. Uh, and he is fastidious, and you can see the wonderful badge on his velvet hat. There are many different kinds of hats uh, throughout the century, and you see these, uh, the Duke of Nemours, uh, this Duke of Urbino, uh, these Florentines, with large badges on their hats. Men also wore, you see the gilded hairnet on the right. Uh, this was another fashion accessory. Uh, uh, that we know of. So badges on hats could be fashionable, but not when it's a Jew's badge. So we know that Rossi was exempted from wearing the badge, uh, that customary orange badge around his hat or beret. So I thought, I found this image of a Paduan Jewish merchant. Again, if you were a merchant traveling around, you wanted to be exempt from wearing the badge. And you can get an idea of what a hat looked like, a kind of beret uh, looked like in the 1490s, not so far from Rossi's time. So 1590s. We, 1590s, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, so if we imagine it, with an orange ribbon, two fingers above the brim that would push it up. Uh, it's really quite astounding. Uh, and what I found as well is, is this remarkable piece of evidence that we said that the Jews often negotiated for not to wear uh, a yellow hat or a yellow badge. Now, in, in preparation for the holy year, 
of 1725. This remarkable document uh, exists. It samples a fabric for Rome's cardinal vicar to confirm the color to be used for the Jewish hats and badges that would be worn for the holy year. Most important to separate Jews from Christians for this great penitential celebration uh, in Rome. But the Jews were part of the negotiations and they're going, you know, we don't want yellow. Uh, they could wear red. And so these pieces are gathered that show different possible colors of uh, what was done. You have egg yellow or dark yellow or orange uh, or even a red that is currently used, but it's an old piece that's lost its brilliance. And they're trying to negotiate what color will be acceptable to both sides. And the Cardinal Vicar decides <laughs> that this piece of silk, and I'm so sorry that the, uh, the image could not be gotten in color, but it's identified as marangolo, bitter orange. And I've tried to show you the fruit of what the color would be for the taffeta of the uh, prescribed seigny, that is the distinguishing markers for the hats. So the colors change throughout, but whether it's a hat or a badge of some sort or clothing markers, Jews wanted the exemption. It was the mark of Cain. It was never a good thing and it was never accepted willingly. Wow. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for this fascinating exposition and, and wonderful that we can actually see these in front of them as, uh, as you're speaking about them. Oh, well, it, it's been a joy to pull, well, joy. <laughs> this kind of work is not joyful, but I will show you something funny just perhaps to conclude. When I was in high school, the well, of course, we had Peter Pan collars on our little white blouses and things like that. Yes, we remember it. But what were also po popular for girls, and I got one uh, for my sweet 16, was a little circle pin. Oh, there it is. Okay. Can you, can you see it? Yes. So I can put it closer to the camera. I'm sorry. I'm trying to find there. There's That's the good. pin That's good. with a little bow on the top. But if I put it there it marks me in a very different way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what the Jews were so worried about. Yeah. Now, badges were finally uh, abolished when uh, the French armies came Napoleon. into Rome and through Italy in 1798. Yeah. And it was only then reestablished uh, during the Third Reich and mm -hmm, Mussolini. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. after that, it was established, though the ghetto walls in Rome stayed up till 1849. Amazing. Yep. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, again, thank you so much, Barbara. Eye opening, eye opening and, and, uh, and wonderful to see those old relics and think of what that means in our own time. Yes, uh, we seem to learn nothing from history yeah. and it's just over and over again it's so uh the times now of course are so disheartening uh and that's the polite version mm -hmm. of it uh but the uh the vicious anti-semitism the jews will not replace you at charlottesville yeah. it just it just never ends so now tiki torches have taken over the badge you know on the opposite side as yeah pilgrim's badges uh, in that way. So I, I hope this is informative for your program. And yet the, the message of Salomone Rossi, who despite all of this, enjoys the culture of the surrounding period and creates new Jewish music in that style, perhaps will give us a positive spin. And of course, how wonderful that the name Rossi itself means red. And he called himself in his Hebrew name, Shalomo Meha Adunim, Solomon of the Reds. So there's our color, not just the yellow, not just the orange, but the red as his pride of being Hebreo. 
Thanks again, Barbara. Thank you so much, Josh. Bye. <laughs>